Welcome again to Europe and You. On the programme this time. The students getting more young people engaged in politics. In the studio, animal welfare. Does the EU have the power to enforce its own laws? And the newest British MEP ready for the job. Uh, I'm absolutely raring to go. Uh, well, I've been raring to go for 10 or 15 years. <laughs> MEPs have seen off an attempt by the food industry to add new labels on packaging. Manufacturers wanted to be able to put what percentage they'd cut the amount of salt, sugar or fat from their products. But a majority in the European Parliament felt that would give shoppers a false impression as to which brand was better for your health. Labour MEP Glenis Wilmot was one of those leading the campaign. She says in the few seconds consumers take to decide what to put in their basket, they mustn't be persuaded by misleading claims. You know, at the moment we have reduced, we have light, low fat, low sugar, low salt, very low salt. How are you supposed to wade through all of this information when you want to make healthy choices for your family? So I think it's best to stick to just the one thing. Let's have reduced. That means it's 30% less than similar products on the market. That's easy to understand and people know exactly what they're buying. A grassroots campaign from Dartford, which aims to get more young people voting, is now getting European interest. Bite the Ballot started in the classroom, but has evolved into a group run by and for young people, spreading across the country. In the last general election, just 39% of 18 to 24 year olds used their right to vote. The campaigners have set the ambitious target of getting that up to 80% by 2015. Southeast MEP Catherine Bearder is supporting their efforts. She brought them out to the European Parliament because she says it's an issue other countries also want to tackle. It's a common problem right across Europe that young people are not engaging with the democratic process. So when they found that there's a group that actually works, uh, they were keen to come and hear about it from the young people themselves. We had um, great debates where young people wouldn't vote and at the end of it are actually saying, Do you know what, I didn't realise politics had so much affected my life, I'm going to vote, We've, we go out to schools around the country, we're kind of inspiring them, getting them motivated, getting them talking about issues that they want, because um, politics is quite complicated, but if you keep it simple and keep it relevant, people are really interested in it. What By the Ballot does is inspire those young people into actually inspiring all the other young people, basically. Um, and that's a model that can be replicated anywhere, really. It's not that we go in and we tell them how to do it. It's that we go in and we give them tools to do it themselves. Still to come. The MEP's Facebook group for Good Eggs. And we meet yet another new face for the West Midlands. Members of the European Parliament often say their post bags are full of letters from constituents about animal welfare. It's something many people care a lot about. And in recent years, the EU has passed new laws to stop the cruelest farming methods. But senior officials admit that enforcing the rules is much more difficult in practice. So how much does it all amount to? Here to discuss the issue, two MEPs with farming backgrounds, the former head of the National Farmers Union in Scotland, George Lyon. And Norfolk farmer and UK Independence Party agricultural spokesman, Stuart Agnew. George Lyon, coming to you first. Since the beginning of this year, there's supposed to be an EU ban in place on uh, old-style battery hen farming. Is it working? No, it's not working. Uh, there are still uh, 13 countries who have not met the deadline to ban these illegal cages. So there are millions of uh, illegally produced eggs floating about in the European market. Consumers expected that on the 1st of January of this year, all uh, eggs would be produced from hens in welfare-friendly cages, and that's not the case. And that, I think, is uh, to be condemned. Stuart Agnew, you're an egg farmer yourself. Uh, uh, what does it mean for the British industry when they've made the investment and others haven't? It means that our colony producers, as they're called now, are very, very vulnerable because they have invested £400 million of their own money, no subsidy in that, 
to get up to the new standard. So they will need a higher price for their eggs. They will have to have that to cover that investment. Meanwhile, slipping into the country are eggs produced in battery cages. We're in this wonderful single market. There's nothing we can do to stop it. In fact, our agriculture minister said, oh, it's against European law to try to stop it. And George mentioned that 13 countries are actually have been found to be still using battery hen farming methods. The European Commission is threatening legal action against those countries. Is that tough enough? Is the EU being tough enough on the countries not making the grade? Well, that sounds frightfully austere, that threatening action. That could probably be three years before it actually comes about. They threaten these infraction proceedings, don't they, where the countries have to pay big fines and if the countries don't pay the fines, it's difficult to force them to. So it could all be too late by then. And our colony producers need to make money. They will be borrowing money. They've got to cover all their costs. And they could go wrong in 18 months if this, if this undermining happens. George Lyon, the, the European Commission's hands are rather tied in this kind of situation, aren't they? They are up to point, but uh, the great fear that everyone would uh, had before we reached the 1st of January, that these countries that decided not to implement in full would actually be given a reward of another further two years derogation to allow them to, to, uh, to meet the standards that's required. Thankfully, the Commission have said no. They've drawn a line in the sand and said, sorry, Inspection teams were sent in, in uh, on the 1st of January. Warning notices were set out in December that they were going to be taken to court. They've now got the evidence and they will be taken to court. But they couldn't do that until, until January began. Yeah, well, that's the problem. Until the, the ban has been broken, you can't actually take a court case. So it's kind of chicken and egg, dare I, dare I use that, <laughs> that, uh, that phrase. Uh, so I, I, I am actually a little bit more sympathetic to the Commission. My great fear was that those who had chosen to flout the regulations would be rewarded with further extensions. They've not been. And I think that consumers, certainly in the UK, can ensure that these illegal eggs are prevented from coming into the UK market by buying British and insisting that every product they buy that has eggs in them is, is sourced from British egg production. That way they can be guaranteed that these illegal eggs are not in the products that they buy in the stores. And it's not just eggs that I know you are concerned about. Pigs is another issue looming on the horizon. That's correct. Uh, we have another uh, ban coming into force on the 1st of January 2013, which will outlaw uh, so-called sows and stalls, uh, and that uh, we've moved to loose housing systems for all uh, pregnant sows. Uh, the information that's just been released from the Commission indicates there's only three member states who are currently compliant and only another four expect to be compliant by the end of the year. We're in danger of a rerun of the eggs fiasco. And consumers out there must be sitting wondering what on earth is all this about? We, we make laws and then countries choose to flout them. So we believe that the Commission need to start showing these countries that they're taking tough action on eggs and that they will take tough action on the pigs uh, directive as well if it's not enforced. Stuart Agnew, I know that your preferred choice might be that the UK wasn't in the EU at all, but given that we are part of the European Union, what is a better solution to, to these kind of circumstances, do you think? The best solution is always consumer power, and consumers need to have confidence in what they're buying. So the retailers for these shell eggs are generally on board. The problem comes in more with processors and caterers, particularly caterers. They just want the cheapest egg available and they will try and get it. Let's send the egg inspectors there, not round to farmers to make our life difficult, and go and say, well, where did that product come from? Those scrambled eggs, powdered scrambled egg. Where did you get it from? And follow the trail back and try and audit it like that. I'm sure that a lot could be done. You'll never stop all of it. As a general rule, though, um, we've mentioned the court action. We've mentioned, George, George talked about, to some extent, the EU's hands are tied until the, the deadline for the enforcement of these laws comes in. As a general rule, how could we improve the way that animal welfare is handled at a European level, do you think? It's very difficult, in my opinion, because of, because of culture. We have always had, in Britain, a very strong culture of animal welfare, a, a, an awareness of it. But you look at Spain, where they're still bullfighting. You look in, in, in Romania and, and Hungary, where those people lived in terrible conditions themselves, let alone 
animals, the culture is different. And I know it's very politically incorrect to talk like this, but that is how it is. And I feel that we can make as many laws as we want in this place. It's the enforcement of them that is the critical thing. And as you said right at the beginning, we're getting a lot of posts. We are. And they will assume that if another law is made, then everything will be OK. But it won't be. What do you think? Do you think another law would solve this? Or is well, there a need for a I different approach? I think we approach? now realise, and, and to be fair to Commissioner Daly, he now realises that uh, new legislation is not the answer to animal welfare issues. What is really, really important is enforcement of the current mm. rules that are in place by every member state. And therefore, I think what, what we should be looking at is giving the Commissioner greater power to actually enforce them and to do so at an earlier stage. Because whether it's on uh, the welfare of hens, whether it's the welfare of pigs, or even animal transport, which is another hugely sensitive issue, the big issue is compliance. It's not that the, the legislation is wrong, it's the lack of compliance with member states. And from a UK farmer's point of view, the last thing we would want to do is withdraw from the European Union because what would happen is the consumers there want higher welfare standards. We have implemented a lot of this unilaterally and the Europe does, does nothing and we end up getting absolutely crucified by being uncompetitive in Europe. So what we need is to ensure that Europe has the power to enforce right across all of the 27 member states the laws that are put in place to ensure that uh, we are competing on a level playing field. The last thing we want to do is withdraw from that uh, position. Stuart Agnew, what do well, you Well, I do about? want to come back. I didn't yeah. think George and I would disagree on much. But he, <laughs> I think he provoked it, didn't he, saying leaving the European Union is not the answer. I think it is the answer because what did Jim Pace say was the problem? He said, oh, we can't stop this stuff coming in because it's European law. And, of course, we've signed all these wretched treaties. We have to adhere to European law. If we weren't in the European Union, we wouldn't. And so we could turn this stuff back if we wanted to. But, but that, George Lyon is yeah, saying that you that, could work on that. Yeah, but that, that's a ridiculous. I mean, the, the, the ban on sow stalls and tethers was introduced by the UK government years ago, way ahead of the rest yeah. of Europe. So we'd be at a, a competitive disadvantage with the rest of Europe if we weren't in there forcing the rest of Europe to come up to our standards. So your recipe actually is to make UK farmers bankrupt. It most certainly is not. Uh, but he's right about the sow stalls and tethers. We, we went unilaterally on that. The government, the Conservative government, decided to do that against the advice of the farming unions. I mean, we can agree on the, that. The consumers we? had a um, huge influence in that debate. Mm. I was involved very heavily in it. We had, mm. we had little old ladies lying down yeah. in the road in front of lorries and all sorts of things. No, but, but nobody uh, so really thought we would simply export the industry. Nobody no. thought that would happen, which is what happened. We went down from 900,000 sows to 550,000 sows because of that. I think we've all learned the lesson. We've all learned the lesson that you can't be unilateral. You have got to accept that you must do something about it if you make your own farmers uh, adhere to higher standards. And we so could... very briefly, finally then, let's ask each of you, there's an EU strategy underway. The, the, the European Commission wants to come forward with a, uh, a European animal welfare strategy to look not just at these two issues, but all of them for the future. Um, what's a better way round of it? You say we've learnt lessons, Stuart uh, Agnew. Not to try and assume that everybody has the same culture. And I, I disagree with where we are. We shouldn't be trying to be one country. We are our own country with our own standards. It'll be years before these others in the South and East catch up with us. There's no point in trying to expect them to do it. Well, I totally disagree. Uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, uh, consumers across Europe expect the same animal welfare standards no matter where they travel or where they go to buy uh, their products. I think that the lesson we have learned is that it's enforcement is the area we need to, to uh, tackle. We need to get the commission, give the Commission the appropriate powers to be able to tackle this at an early stage and ensure follow through that it's actually delivered. That's where the, the areas and all these animal welfare issues we need to address in the new animal welfare strategy. Well, we'll have to wait to see whether that strategy does indeed have an impact, but that's all we've got time for for now. So thank you to both of you very much for joining us. Well, as you heard in that debate, the European Commission is threatening legal action against 13 countries found to be flouting the ban on battery hen cages. But one MEP has come up with an idea for how consumers can also play their part in getting illegal eggs off the market. All UK-produced eggs now meet the new welfare standards. 
and the government has got major outlets to promise not to stock imported battery eggs. But to make sure none are slipping through the net, Julie Gerling has launched her Good Egg, Bad Egg Facebook campaign, encouraging shoppers to put their retailers on the spot. If you go to your supermarket and you're not sure, ask them. Make them find out for you. Uh, because if I say, for example, Italy is not compliant by quite a long way. So you buy a panettone, it's made in Italy, you wouldn't be sure whether that has, what sort of egg has that got? Ask the retailer. And if they can't answer, don't buy it. And if they can answer and they say, they can tell you that it's, it's, they're not um, from these small caged eggs, great. Advertise it on the website. Let people know so that that's where they can go and buy. Earlier this year, we introduced you to Anthea McIntyre, the additional Conservative MEP for the West Midlands. Well, now the region has a new Lib Dem name also to get used to. Liz Lynn decided to stand down after 12 years in the job, and now she's been replaced by the next on the party list from the last election, Staffordshire farmer Phil Bennion. We caught up with him taking his seat in the European Parliament for the first time. He told us he wants to encourage an entrepreneurial spirit in Europe. I'm a former researcher. I was an agricultural researcher many years ago. Uh, I've been f just farming for the last 25 years, but uh, I, I do work very, very closely still with the agricultural research community. And um, we also need to look at engineering research. We need to look at the universities. We, we, we need to, to be pushing forward a, 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 the agenda of the future. And next time on Europe and You, we'll hear from another new MEP due to take up her seat shortly, the Liberal Democrat MEP, Rebecca Taylor. But that's all for this edition of the programme. Follow us on Twitter and on our website, but we'll see you again soon. Goodbye.